Today on Christian World News, a time for peace. A Muslim rebel group in the Philippines signs a major deal to end decades of war. We'll tell you what it means for this Christian nation in Asia. Plus, making history in Indonesia. This man holds the highest government post ever won by a Christian in that Muslim nation. We'll tell you how he beat the odds. And voting their values, why Christians across the United States are being encouraged to vote not just for a political party, but for support of biblical values. And welcome to this week's edition of Christian World News, everyone. I'm George Thomas. My colleague, Wendy Griffith, is on assignment. Well, big news out of Philippines this week. The government and the nation's largest Muslim rebel group took the first steps ever to creating a lasting peace in the war-torn southern Philippines. If the agreement holds, it could mean peace for the first time in 40 years. Gary Lane has the details. Emotions ran high among several Muslim groups during the peace agreement signing ceremony with the Philippine government. After 16 years of talks and failed agreements, negotiators say this peace plan will end an Islamic insurgency in the southern Philippines. The peace pact creates a new Islamic political entity within the Republic of the Philippines. Philippine President Aquino also believes the agreement will bring lasting peace to the southern Philippines. Join me in imagining. A Mindanao finally free from strife where people achieve their fullest potential. Children who have had to witness immeasurable suffering will now get to witness a harvest. Families who once cowered in fear of gunshots will now emerge from their homes to a bright new dawn of equity, justice and peace. The 40-year war between the government and the MILF has claimed more than 120,000 lives. More than 2 million people have been displaced. When the soldiers bombed our mosque, my two brothers, sister-in-law and nephew were killed. I was also being harassed by soldiers and that's why we decided to flee. We had to run and live in the evacuation center. There, my baby got sick with dengue fever. She died because we did not get any medical help. Bishop Ephraim Tendero is national director of the Philippine Council of Evangelical Churches. He says the peace agreement is God's answer to many years of prayer. He calls on the church and the whole nation to get involved to help it succeed. We need to pray that God will move the government, the people involved, and everyone. Let's have that hope that there will be a continuous um, progress for peace. Jesus said that we need to love our neighbor, and uh, we call on our people to love our neighbor. And the Bangsamoro nation would be our neighbor. And many believe a successfully implemented peace accord may not only serve as a model for other secessionist movements in the Philippines, but also the entire world. And Gary Lane joins us for more analysis. This is a big deal. I mean, yeah, they, they've been fighting for 40 years, the Moro Liberation Front. Uh, they've been wanting an autonomous, a separate country. They didn't get it. Uh, what have they agreed for instead? Well, they've agreed to have autonomy there, and the Philippine government will still have some control over their lives there, you know, army, that kind of thing, postal service, banking, coinage, that type of thing. But it'll be a separate area. They yeah. will have their own state within the Philippines. They've been fighting for a separate country all this yeah. time. Do you have a sense that they will institute Islamic Sharia law here? Well, that's a very strong possibility. Mm -hmm. And what will that mean for the Christians then? Will the Christians be subjected to Sharia as well? Will they be under Sharia courts and Sharia law? That has to be worked out yet. One of the uh, people in the, in the interview was talking about, you know, we, we, we were dealing with gunshots, we were dealing with constant fear. Yeah. What was it like for Christians who lived in this majority Muslim? Well, uh, and it still uh, is. It's, n it's not a very good situation situation for Christians there. They are a minority. They first came after the Second World War down into this area. They became farmers. They had large plantations there, very successful business people. A lot of the Muslims were very poor, and they became jealous of that. Mm -hmm. And uh, there was some oppression there and some persecution, especially those who would go and share their Christian faith with the Muslims. It'll be interesting to see how this all plays out in the days and months ahead. Yes. Stick with us for a second. Okay. I, I need to get your uh, analysis on another story. We are a, a big story that we are going to cover here for a second. Uh, a Christian politician has made history in the world's largest Muslim nation. He's been elected to one of the nation's highest posts. And as my colleague Lucille Talusans uh, details, here's the story. 
CBN News first told you about Basuki Purnama's bid for vice governor of Jakarta back in September. Despite opposition from Muslim groups, he won that election, becoming the first Christian to win such a high post in the capital city. This week, he was sworn in, even though some Muslims tried to prevent it. Purnama's inauguration ceremony was delayed by hardliners who demonstrated in front of the city council. As vice governor, Purnama will hold important positions in eight Islamic bodies in the capital. The hardliners believe Purnama is not capable of leading them because he is Christian. Religion is our own private matter. It's different in public. I abide to the Pancasila Foundation that promotes the acceptance of diversity by respecting the identity of every religion, ethnicity, and group. I abide by the constitution and the unity of Indonesia as a nation. Purnama, who is also ethnic Chinese, is known for his clean and honest leadership. Reformation that I'll be doing is enforcing transparency in servanthood in what we're doing as public officials. Boas Pengabeyan is happy over Purnama's victory. Purnama is born again. I believe this is God's destiny for him and he has responded to his calling. I am confident now that my children will have a good future under his leadership. He can even be the next president of Indonesia. Purnama may be facing a lot of pressure being the first Christian vice governor in the capital. But then again, this is a great opportunity for a Christian like him to bring the much-needed reforms to this nation. Lucille Talusan, CBN News, Jakarta. Thanks, Lucille. Uh, Gary Lane is back with us. I mean, this is this is historic. Oh, it's I mean, very it's big. significant. I mean, a Christian yeah. in a majority Muslim, and he has such a high post. Tell us about the significance well, of Well, it. that has never happened before in Indonesia, and Christians, as you know, are a minority there. So this gives great hope to them that the government will at least listen to their concerns, and they will have someone they can go to a sounding board. For somebody like this to represent in the highest levels of, of government there, what does it mean for the minority Christians? I know we've been yes. reporting about the relaxation of the laws and some of the, uh, you know, the ability for the church to, 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 to thrive. What does it mean for the believers well, it, there? I don't think it means an end to persecution because many churches are still being shut down there. Christians are forced to worship in house churches and so forth. But I think what it means, it encourages them. Maybe others will run for office. They will know that they have a part of this government. They are Indonesian too. Mm -hmm. That's what it says. I know Muslims were not too happy about his... Uh, Some about Muslims. His, yeah. uh, there is a radical element within the, within the country do you get a sense that uh, that Indonesia could ever become an Islamic state per se? No, but you know there are indications that be, it, there will be more Christians mm -hmm. uh, coming along because many Muslims are coming to faith there in Christ. And one prediction says maybe by 2030, 2035, it'll be a Christian majority nation, which is incredible it would for be, that to, it? to happen. Yes. Well, thank you and thanks for your insights on both the Philippines. Very historic. Story. It is in both places. Thank you as always, Gary. Well. Security forces in Shiraz, Iran, raided a private home and arrested seven Christians for holding a prayer meeting recently. Christian Solidarity Worldwide says authorities are carrying out a massive campaign of harassment against Christians of all denominations. Meanwhile, five Christians detained in a raid eight months ago are now facing trial. Their alleged crimes include propagation against the Islamic regime and defaming Islamic holy figures through Christian evangelization. CSW Chief Executive Mervyn Thomas says there appears to be an increasing tendency by the Iranian authorities to char characterize legitimate religious activities as crimes against the state. In reality, people are being harassed merely on account of their faith. The campaign targets not only Christians, but members of the Baha'i faith and other religious minorities. Well, up next, the party's over. How Republicans and Democrats are being encouraged to forget party loyalty and vote for biblical values. CWnews.org, your constant news source on the World Wide Web. Find daily updates on the global church. Watch the weekly broadcast. Three former presidents come together to honor the life and ministry. Also available in podcast. The in-depth insights into our reporter blogs. Taliban kidnapped at least 18 In South Korea, Korean Christians. Your Christian. online news source for complete coverage of the global church. Today, many people are asking, what is the future for America? 
I believe God created this country to be an exceptional nation with a divine purpose. God has a plan, not only for the redemption of mankind, not only for the people of Israel, but for the United States of America. Get Pat Robertson's newest DVD teaching, God's Plan for America, How to Prepare for the Days Ahead. In it, you will discover how America is built on a Christian foundation, how America became the greatest country on earth, and what we can do to see the favor of God bless our land. There is still an opportunity to enter into a period of unprecedented prosperity and national blessing if we will grasp hold of the plan God has for each one of us. Pat Robertson's God's Plan for America. It's our gift to you when you join the 700 Club. Available now. It began in a prayer meeting where a covenant was made and grew into the most powerful and prosperous nation the world has ever known. But has America broken its covenant with God? Can that covenant be renewed? Does God still have a plan for America? And welcome back to Christian World News. Well, the U.S. presidential election is just weeks away. Republican challenger Mitt Romney is seeking to unseat President Barack Obama. Many Christian leaders are also campaigning hard, but they're not pushing a specific candidate per se. They're urging Christian voters instead to rely on biblical principles when they cast their vote. Ephraim Graham has that story. With only weeks until the 2012 presidential election, a familiar name in politics is on a last minute campaign push. You talk about the importance of voting. But Dr. Alveda King, niece of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., is not supporting a specific candidate or party. The party's over. This is not party time. Mm -hmm. This is a uh, serious time because, you know, America needs to be fixed. And there's a desire in my heart to see that. And so I say to people, when you look at a ballot, vote for the absolute best candidate on the ballot. And for King, that candidate is the one who most reflects biblical principles. That's her message to voters during this Vote His Principles rally. We can vote our values or we can vote God's principles. And God's principles are just so very clear. And that actually should transcend a political party. King isn't alone. They say opposition to same-sex marriage is the same as opposition to interracial marriage. That is an insult to human intelligence. It is a lie. No Christian should support this. Bishop E.W. Jackson takes his message to black church leaders, challenging them to resist what he calls blind loyalties. It's not about race, it's about righteousness. It's not about party, it's about principle. It's about voting in a way that will please God. That's what the ultimate goal ought to be. A guide to achieving that goal can be found in a new book called How Should Christians Vote? Its author is Tony Evans pastor of Oak Cliff Bible Fellowship Church in Dallas, Texas. If God is involved in government and God is the author of government and God de determines what is good and what is evil, then he should be consulted on all issues. Before voting, Evans encourages Christian voters to get out a sheet of paper, write down an issue of concern in one column, where Democrats stand in the next column, then where Republicans stand. And finally, what God says about the issue. You vote for the party, the platform, the candidate, or the policies that closest reflect the values of the kingdom of God. And Evans is quick to point out, God is neither Democrat nor Republican. He's the consummate independent because he only votes for himself. And uh, he doesn't ride the backs of donkeys or elephants. So the great tragedy today is that we've reduced him uh, to partisan politics rather than from a Christian perspective, recognizing he's his own king with his own kingdom and he makes his judgments based on how consistent people are with his rule. And Pastor Evan says God's rule should rule how Christians vote. Nothing wrong with voting values. It's one of the three legitimate influences that can motivate anyone in going into the polls. Regent University's Dr. Charles Dunn says the bottom line is everyone votes values, whether they vote party loyalty, a specific issue, or candidate. We all vote values. We vote economic values. 
We vote social values. We vote religious values. Ephraim Graham, CBN News. Great story, Ephraim. The Reverend Billy Graham is among those encouraging Americans to vote their biblical beliefs. He took out a full-page ad in the Wall Street Journal. Graham's advertisement reads in part, I urge you to vote for those who protect the sanctity of life and support the biblical definition of marriage between a man and a woman. Mr. Graham also urged voters to pray America remains one nation under God. Political experts say a push to support biblical principles usually appeals to the Republican Party and it's unlikely to sway voters who already have made up their minds. I personally um, am a Christian and, and like to vote based on my biblical beliefs and my spiritual values. Um, and I would tend to vote for a candidate that, that values that as well. You're doing being very sneaky and insidious about endorsing one candidate without saying the actual words. And over the next few weeks, Graham's ad will run in USA Today and several other newspapers in as many as a dozen states. Well, coming up next, here comes the bride, and she's only eight years old. Our cameras captured what outsiders rarely see, the wedding ceremonies of India's child brides. Stay tuned for our exclusive report after this. CBNnews.com. News you want, when you want, 24-7. Stay current with up-to-the-minute stories. Ephraim Graham, CBN News, New York. I don't have to wait for my news anymore. CBNnews.com, at your fingertips all day long. I only watch the stories I want to see. I find the story, I click on it, and boom, I'm there. Embassy in Washington, Eric Stackelbeck, CBN News. The source for your news, CBNnews.com. Come on, Give me that. <laughs> Bye. Ah, sure, life is busy, but I found a way to make a huge difference in people's lives. I guess you could say I'm changing the world right here from home. I bring medical supplies and doctors to people in need and dig wells so that villagers can have clean and safe water to drink. I make it possible to preach the gospel in over 100 countries, including right here in America. And when disaster strikes, I'm there providing food, thank you, and emergency supplies to give people hope again. Every day, CBN and I are making the world a better place. Here you go. <laughs> my life is hectic, so I join CBN through Pledge Express. My bank does all the work, and I know that my gift is being used where it's needed most. So become a CBN partner and join Pledge Express, because you can do a world of good right from where you are. Good morning. Are you ready to get started? When you care, souls are set free. When you give, lives are made new. When you share, eternal life begins. When we all come together to love, miracles happen. In Northern Ireland, hundreds gathered to protest the country's first abortion clinic. Northern Ireland is the only corner of the UK that has not legalized abortion on demand. Mary Stopes International is behind the new clinic. It's a British charity that already operates similar clinics in more than 40 countries. The centre plans to offer the abortion pill to women who are less than nine weeks pregnant, but only if a doctor, doctor determines they're at risk of death or long-term health damage from the pregnancy. India is the child marriage capital of the world. The United Nations says more than 40% of all child marriages happen there, even though the practice is illegal. Here's my exclusive report from Rajasthan, India. Rajasthan is the epicenter of India's child marriage. More than half of the girls born in this state become child brides before the age of 15. The life of a child bride is very sad. Prem Dabi is studying its impact on Indian society. The moment she gets married from a physical, mental, emotional and educational perspective, her life becomes very challenging. Most of India's rural poor live on less than a dollar a day, so marrying off a daughter means one less mouth to feed. Dinesh Sur is a village pastor. 
Girls are seen as a liability and burden. The girl's family is responsible for paying the dowry, so the longer they wait to get the girl married off, the more they'll have to pay the future in-laws. April and May are popular months for marriages in Rajasthan. Villages will hold thousands of ceremonies, the majority of them between minors. Every year, you'll see the images of parents holding their children, sometimes as young as four or five years old, in their lap as they get married. India first introduced laws against child marriage back in 1929, and back then, the legal age uh, for marriage was set at 12. It was eventually increased to 18 years old in 1978. To evade the law, families will often perform marriages in secret, usually late at night. It's shortly after um, 9 o'clock in the evening, very, very busy streets as you can see. But where we're going is into the interior villages of, uh, of this part of Rajasthan. Outsiders are rarely allowed to attend these ceremonies, let alone film them. <laughs> Rajma Patel's parents made an exception, giving us permission to film their son, but only the night before his wedding. I am becoming a man tomorrow. His parents insist that he's 21, but his friends told us off camera that he's only 10. His young face covered in traditional makeup, he wears a special suit with flashing colored lights. I want the youngsters in my village to follow my example. The whole village spends the night before the wedding drinking and dancing. Under the influence of alcohol, these dance rituals become sexually charged and often you'll see young boys and girls joining in. It becomes a place to find potential child suitors. Our team isn't allowed to film Patel's bride, who is said to be no more than eight or nine years old. The parents always lie about the child's age. Families know what they are doing is not right, but because of culture and economic reasons, the parents will marry their children off at a young age. CBN News is allowed, however, to film Veena Soor's wedding. Hers is different. It takes place during the day, which is very uncommon. We've been preparing for this wedding for nearly a year. Veena is trying to look her best as she prepares to teeter down the aisle of her house. I've invited the entire village to come for this happy occasion. But Veena is anything but happy. In between combing her hair and putting on jewelry, she sobs uncontrollably. The family tries to console her. We try to ask her why she's crying. Why is she sad? She refuses to talk. She has no idea what it means to be a wife how to take care of her family. But because this has been forced upon her, she has to go along with it. I think she's a little scared. Veena's family insists their daughter is 18, but she looks seven or eight. I also got married when I was very young. She will adjust. India is only one of many countries where child marriage is thriving. Each year, some 10 million girls are married before they turn 18. Practice is most common in Africa, the Middle East, and South Asia. The girl is married, then moves in with her husband's family. She's not allowed to go to school to get an education. As soon as she reaches puberty, she's expected to have children. And the ripple effects are devastating. Research shows that girl brides are more likely to die during pregnancy and childbirth, lose her child before it's born, be infected with HIV, have three or more births, and undergo multiple abortions. Back in the village, Veena's soon-to-be husband arrives in a bus with his side of the family. Wearing a special crown with flashing lights, he joins a procession of villagers making their way to the bride's home. His face is partially covered by a multicolored mask that he'll wear until the ceremony is over. He too looks very young, but his family insists he's about the legal age of marriage. I am ready to be a husband. Veena is finally ready to make her appearance, but instead of walking down the family courtyard where guests are awaiting her arrival, she has to be carried in by her father. Weak and exhausted, she is overcome with emotions. She sobs through the two-hour ceremony. 
It is heartbreaking to watch. These are children, little children, getting married. And you may be asking the question, what are Christians doing? Well, they are taking a stand against child brides. There are churches that are trying to educate these rural communities about the dangers and also the horrible uh, implications of, of having small girls and boys married off at such a young age. And in the process, trying to share the gospel with these folks. Well, we'd, you'd like, we'd like to hear your thoughts on this story. Log on to our Christian World News Facebook page. Leave your comments and share this story with your friends. We'll be back right after this. Now, this is Pat Robertson. This is an important time in the history of America. It's an important time in the history of CBN. And what you do is so very important now. But we've got to get the gospel out here in America. We've got to help the poor and the needy, feed those who are hungry, clothe those who are naked, bring medical attention to those who are suffering, and more than anything, bring hope to those who are without hope throughout the world. So your 700 Club membership makes a huge difference. And I ask you to go to your phone and call. If you haven't already called in, we appreciate what you've done so much. So don't slack. We don't want our hands to be empty. We want to say, Lord, here are those who have come to you because of my labors. Telephones are available, toll-free line, and we just thank God for each one of you. So don't hesitate to call and do it now. When you give, smiles grow bigger. When you care, homes are happier. When you comfort, the hurt goes away. When we all come together to love, miracles happen. Christian World News, your window to the global church for stories of revival. revival. Persecution of relatives and fellow Christians born in the first country over the international day. I'm George Thomas in Baghdad and coming up on the broadcast an exclusive interview. And the impact of Christian leaders. Watch Christian World News. And finally, on the broadcast this week, earlier this month, Egyptian Christians gathered for an urgent time of prayer and fasting seeking God's protection from the rising influence of Islam on Egyptian society. Well, here's something you don't often see in the Muslim-dominated Middle East. This is a prayer video of a massive prayer gathering called One Thing. 10,000 Egyptian Christian youth united in the desert for praise, prayer, and worship. They gathered each day from 10 a.m. until 10 p.m. Some traveled hundreds of miles from southern Egypt to attend. An estimated 2 million people around the world Watch the event online. Please continue to pray for the folks in Egypt and around the world, those who are suffering greatly for their faith. I hope you've enjoyed our broadcast this week. That's all from all of us here at Christian World News. Until next week, goodbye and God bless you.